Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Anna Engelhard and today with me, Jared Davis. We're in the space of the exhibition called The Green Room. It's essentially an exhibition about politics of platforms. The exhibition is curated by Reem Shadid at VO Curations. And uh, today's workshop is the part of the public program for the exhibition. Um, and uh, Charles Davis is going to give a presentation about his experience and research on the politics of platforms and how platforms essentially present themselves as like neutral facilitator of relationship between artists and musicians and their audience. Great. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, thank you very much to Anna and Baha for the invitation um, today. And uh, yeah, I, I hope that this is a, a nice little addition to the discussions of um, the exhibition here at VO Curations. Um, as Anna mentioned, my name is Jared. Um, I am a writer and a curator, and I'm also the um, uh, associate uh, editor of AQNB, which is an uh, online editorial platform. We're based here in London as well as LA, um, and we, we, we cover art and music and digital culture. Um, uh, I'll, I'll get into a little bit more about what we do a little bit um, later on in this discussion. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, this is going to be, I, I've got a bit of information and materials that I'm going to present to you guys. And uh, at any point, if there's anyone sort of watching on YouTube or in the um, Zoom discussion, uh, and you would like to um, sort of butt in and have a, have a, have a question and ask us, um, yeah, just uh, either put it in the chat on YouTube and I probably won't catch it myself, but maybe Anna can just like tap me on the shoulder and just feel free to interject at any time. So uh, the, f the first little slide that I have up um, here, uh, this slide is uh, related to the blurb that I put out um, at the, uh, the, the information that you would have read um, just in the description and uh, in the sign up form. Um, this is from 2015 um, and the image that we're showing is um, from Apple Music. Um, this is the landing page of their connect, func um, connect function of Apple Music, which admittedly has sort of didn't catch on and has gone, gone defunct. Um, but when it came out in 2015, uh, it was really interesting to me. Um, this was when they first launched um, Apple Music as a streaming platform competitor to Spotify. And they introduced Connect at the same time and they sort of saw it necessary to have this sort of uh, what Connect was is, is a social media element to Apple Music. So it wasn't enough to just have a streaming platform. They had to have some kind of social element to it. Um, and I, I guess basically what, what it was was a, a, a way for artists um, to kind of share post updates uh, on their official pages and then have communications with other um, with fans directly and really just trying to, I guess, move some of that communication off Twitter and Instagram um, and for Apple to sort of capture it themselves. Uh, and I really was obsessed with this copy a little bit, Artist Fans Zero Interference, um, because for me, it sort of, it, uh, it spoke to a couple things. First of all, it was sort of like a, felt like a bit of a watershed moment or an end point in this kind of breakdown between um, the artist and the fan as this kind of like now this circular kind of collective um, kind of two-way street, uh, which is very sort of significant for the like user-generated content age that we'll talk a bit about. And the other thing is that, of course, the irony of, I mean, this zero interference thing, um, there was a big interference and it was the, the interface itself. It was Apple Music is um, inter well, the intermediary between artists and fans here very much. But what they're trying to do here and what they're sort of connect communicating with this copy is they're trying to make that um, as invisible as, as possible. Um, so uh, uh, that's sort of significant, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So really what, what Apple um, uh, is, is interested in, in here if, with Apple Music is they, they don't really want to sell the music themselves. They don't want to be like a record label, but they want to have this kind of invisible ownership over the all the communication um, around music, not necessarily just the music. Music is, I guess, a form of communication, but... Uh, on top of that, there's also the, this fandom and there's there's the sort of um, communication between artists' personal and, and public lives to the fans. You know, communication is, is sort of what Apple's trying to capture here. Um, yeah. 
so uh, uh, a little bit on like why I think um, music subcultures are, uh, I guess, interesting and important way of uh, sort of thinking through uh, digital platforms in general and, and digital culture. Um, and a little bit back to, I should just say that this, this what I'm going to go through in this talk um, starting in 2015 um, is a, sort of a result of some research that I was doing for a few years before joining AQ&B on, on digital platforms and DIY music culture. And um, so uh, in that, I, I was sort of obsessed at this time <laughs> uh, with this kind of notion of the DIY ethos that we sort of first saw in punk music culture. Um, I found it really interesting that like this kind of thought that the DIY ethos of punk music um, was kind of a bit of like a canary in the mine um, or sort of a yeah an oracle moment for what would come um, a few decades down the line with user-generated content of social media and web 2.0. Um, of course, this, you know, this uh, sort of idea that, you know, everyone can be an artist. Um, uh, we, we sort of, that was a big part of the DIY ethos of punk um, was, yeah, it was this sort of initial watershed moment that was very importantly facilitated by technology. So, it was the you know the new affordability of cassette tapes, um, uh, well not cassette tapes but also like four track recorders that musicians now realise that they could um, sort of rather than ha ha having this necessary like technocratic record label um, as the sort of necessary intermediary for them to make music they could just make it in their bedrooms um, and this like. Uh, timed very importantly as well, I think, with some of the sort of cultural developments of the 1970s, you know, after the sort of 60s um, uh, sort of protests, I guess, against um, um, the mass sort of conformist culture of the post-war period, like the 1950s um, uh, sort of uh, society, of the, what society of the spectacles sort of critiquing this sort of mass conformist consumerism. Um, you know, we sort of start to get not only like things like punk, that was a sort of a subcultural movement, but in sort of mainstream uh, sort of thinking as well, there's a lot of writing on how business management culture started to shift towards um, kind of ideas of self-expression um, and individualism as being very key. And I think like right now we're really living in this age where, you know, individualism and, and self-expression is sort of a, a bit of a dogma a little bit. So, um, yeah. Sorry, I have I have a whole bunch of notes here that I just like if I pause at any point, I don't really want to make this too much of a me reading from the page. So if I'm pausing, I'm just sort of like gathering my thoughts a little bit to kind of make it a bit more um, colloquial and informal. Um, yeah, so uh, really in a nutshell, um, this kind of shift with punk um, towards using cheap technology like cassettes, I sort of saw this as like a broader cultural shift in power from... Um, um, those who controlled the content, so like um, record labels and broadcasters, etc., um, to those who kind of controlled the means of communication. So in the case of, you know, um, in the 1980s, it was companies like Sony that were producing like the cassette um, recorders, multi-track recorders and Walkmans and these kind of things. These start to become the powerful tech companies over, you know, I guess it's sort of in terms of like, Maybe I don't, I don't really know of, in terms of the actual numbers of, of what were the bigger companies at the time, but it feels like ideologically there's now the shift from um, controlling the content itself to controlling the means of communicating the content. Uh, I really saw this like punk beginnings as like a sort of first instance of what like Mackenzie Walk is, is calling the vectoralist class. And I'm going to talk about that. So I'll, I'll define that term a little bit. Uh, and just to sort of define my terms a little bit more as well, if I'm talking about Web 2.0, um, I'm talking about, you know, from the, the mid-2000s, this kind of shift forward from sort of a browser-based internet where you're going to a website and reading the content that's given to you to this more interactive um, social media um, where users upload their own content and sort of create, um, you know, content themselves, which, which is really what we kind of know of as the internet today. Um, and also... Um, I guess user-generated content is another big keyword in relation to that. Um, yeah, so 
I mean, I, if I could just be like a little, uh, not to be egotistical, but I, I'll just quote myself because it's just easier from a, a piece I wrote in 2016 um, that sort of sums up like basically this preamble of, of where these interests were coming from is that uh, 40 years after punk called on music listeners to ditch the major record labels and do it yourself, a new platform oriented entertainment industry actively encourages the unpaid creative labor of users offering the reward of becoming a visual artist on Instagram, a filmmaker on YouTube, an actor on Vine at the time, which doesn't exist anymore, um, or a musician on SoundCloud, um, with the lines between these practices increasingly blurring. So yeah, um, this is kind of like a preamble. Um, uh, so we, we're basically in this talk, I'm you know, sort of, we're taking now as a, like the preface that we're kind of in this, this age of user-generated content where everyone's an artist, um, creating for platforms, everyone kind of gets their 15 minutes of fame uh, and this kind of urge to s express yourself um, uh, and communicate is kind of like a, an ideological hallmark of our sort of neoliberal present. Um, this is sort of the background. Uh, and what I'm interested in doing in this talk um, a little bit and workshop, if anyone has any questions about anything I'm saying and it's unclear, just sort of shout out online. Um, is uh, maybe sort of introducing uh, uh, on top of that idea, like some uh, maybe theoretical frameworks that are found in this research to be quite interesting that we can sort of apply to thinking not only about music subcultures on the internet, but about broader um, uh, platform capitalism. Uh, and then applying a little bit of that to my more recent experiences working on the editorial team of AQ and B. Um, and yeah, some of, some of how um, this stuff has sort of affected us as a digital platform. Um, so yeah, well, here is where I'll just test the sound a little bit. Um, so I want to, um, even though I, I introduced this with punk, um, it's not playing yet, good. Um, even though I introduced this about punk, primarily what I want to sort of be looking at um, musically and aesthetically is kind of more recent internet subcultures. Um, so I'll start with what I was looking at a few years ago, um, a research interest around um, Nightcore, um, which is uh, an a, a, a online, um, very online oriented subgenre, basically kind of just consisted of um, uh, like Eurotrance or pop tunes um, sped up about 10, 15%. Um, and then sort of the result was that the tracks were kind of sort of high energy, a lot more kawaii sounding, and they're often paired with um, uh, like anime thumbnails on the SoundCloud profiles. Nightcore was originally actually a group. Um, I think they were a Norwegian duo that were named Nightcore and then it just became this kind of internet subgenre. Um, and why Nightcore? I mean, uh, for me, this is kind of, Oh, I was writing at the time with a bit of interest that this was maybe a, a um, uh, it's not playing yet, by the way, the sound. Yeah, 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 In intentionally, because it's going to be a bit full on when it, when it plays. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, both of these genres like um, punk and nightcore were very necessarily kind of facilitated by the technology that made a low barrier to entry. So like um, cassette technology of punk um, kind of defined its aesthetic in a way um, this is kind of low, low-fi sounds, but with Nightcore, um, it was this real. There's a re even lower barrier to entry than punk. You know, it was, it was this punk um, sort of mottos of it was easy, it was cheap, go and do it. And here's a chord, here's another, here's a third. Now form a band. You don't even need to know three chords to start a Nightcore project. All you need is some cheap or free, like Audacity digital audio, um, um, audio workstation software, and just hit speed up 10% and find an anime picture on the internet and there you go, you're a nightcore artist. Every, anyone can be an artist in the sort of punk sense. So um, I'm gonna just play a little bit of it just to get a, get a sense. Hot sweats and cold sweaters I feel a little lost since you've been gone The blame helps me feel better Until you run across the cloud I'm on You're reaching for a hand that's in the past And beaches where the sand is turned to glass Television life could channel these lies You can't put your eyes around a memory Ooh, You can't put Okay, I think that's enough. Um, cool. Uh, 
Yeah, so uh, that was Nightcore a few years ago, and it's had um, big uh, sort of, I guess, subcultural uh, influence stylistically over more contemporary genres as well. Um, there's artists working today, um, often the term that's kind of bandied about, including by a, spot of, a very prominent Spotify play playlist is, is hyperpop. Um, and sort of younger artists now um, that are not necessarily making nightcore, but producing their own music and with same sort of similar aesthetics of like pitched up vocals. And um, I'm going to play a little fan made video um, here of Black Winter Wells, just as a bit of a comparison. You can start to see some of the similarities aesthetically. But um, this, I should say, is not Black Winter Wells, the artist's own official video. It's a fan made video. Um, I don't know if they would endorse the sort of anime aesthetics themselves, but um, that's interesting in itself, I guess, given the discussion that we're talking about. And I'll be talking about a bit more about how important this kind of like cycle between artists and fans as a sort of collective labor um, is, is a big key here. But Um, so yeah, it was, uh, yeah, as I just said, it was like free audio software that was really important in, in making these genres happen. And it also affect the aesthetics. And I don't know if people re recall maybe a few years ago when, um, uh, I think when, when PC music, the record label came out a few years ago, it was a really in kind of in music journalism, maybe as well. Um, it was a sort of formative moment, or maybe it felt like a real generational switch because, um, I guess up until that time, like the sort of aesthetic signifiers of independent music for like Gen X and below were really bound up in the technology and the media of like four track cassette recorders and cheap recording um, because, you know, the means what, what people, ha if you had means to make a really slick, glossy recording, um, you're probably working with a major record label or something because that wasn't so readily accessible for bedroom production. Uh, it, it sort of started as an artifact, I guess in the 70s and 80s, um, but by the 90s really became an institution like lo-fi as this sort of aesthetic signifier of independence. Um, so then when something like PC Music comes out, they were independent musicians making stuff in the, at home or whatever, uh, and they were, it was a subcultural kind of thing, um, but it confused so many people because it was, it was so um, divisive, I guess, because, it, I mean, it's, it's this, uh, this sort of moment where I guess the aesthetics of lo-fi are no longer a sort of an effective um, uh, sort of signifier of independence. And that's all related to the technology, I guess, the media. Um, yeah, so anyways. Um, so yeah, I wanted to like move on now into sort of talking about these um, kind of uh, theoretical tools a little bit. I mentioned um, Mackenzie Walk's sort of idea of the vectorless class, vectorless class um, a bit earlier in relation to the shift from to like controlling the means of communication and so um i think I, I, she'll describe it better than me so uh or, or really well so i'm just going to play this little video now um and just give uh just just a definition of the vectorless class and the hacker class um to skip forward a bit What if those who uh, produce information are not workers? I call them hackers, and it's a word that maybe I uh, didn't date that well, so call it what you like. But let's think of different ways of describing what it means to be someone who produces information but doesn't own or control it, because that's what most people I know do in a metropolitan city. Yeah, that's what most labor is that isn't maintenance and service work. So well, then who ends up owning and controlling all that information? So I, I called that ruling class the vectorless class in the sense that it's ownership and control of the vector of information. It's storage, it's logistics, uh, it's brands, it's copyrights. Uh, 
you don't need to own the means of production anymore to be a ruling class, and that strikes me as really quite particular. A vector is just a line of fixed length but any position at all, so it has this sense of a technical specificity that you can deploy in lots of different ways. So that struck me as sort of a useful metaphor for thinking about how you can control a specific thing but then thread any resources on the planet anywhere. Cool. Um, yeah, I'll just stop it there. So, um, yeah, basically this, this idea that... Um, yeah, she says you don't need to own the means of production anymore. Um, you, uh, the vectorless class, um, you know, I guess the capitalist class own the factories, um, producing material goods of industrialization. The vectorless class controls um, or extracts value from kind of controlling these kind of vectors of communication that can be sort of transferred in different sort of ways. When when Apple wants to move on from from um, the iPhone as being this sort of the means of communication they can easily apply their kind of we just we got we turn to apple for like their kind of brand as a as a sort of intermediary for communication we don't necessarily it doesn't have to be the, the iphone it could become a smartwatch it could become um like a smart home eventually uh and as mackenzie walker said you know a apple's not a phone maker they outsource that that sort of material side of their their production um yeah, so vectorless class, I think, is a really useful term in kind of understanding, um, uh, I mean, I guess, of course, platform capitalism in general, but definitely through music and music as an important um, sort of means of communication and music as a means of, uh, I guess, as what I'm interested in here is like, um, why, why look at music subcultures and music um, to understand the broader sort of politics of this is I think that um, music really has an outsized cultural role in helping us kind of communicate and we can kind of look through culture, look through music to culture at large. Uh, and I think a good example of that is how kind of these shifts in how music is distributed have really affected uh, uh, our communication more generally, like, um, you know, uh, shifts in kind of music culture towards um, sort of user participation and changes in fans have really um, predated the user-generated content that sort of sits at culture at large. And likewise, music was very important for the development of the internet itself. So, um, yeah, and, and um, I guess, yeah, the musician is is the the hacker class um, in, in, in Mackenzie Walks. The hacker class are those that sort of produce the information that's sort of extracted and, and exploited by the vectorless class. Um, yeah, and so I guess the most obvious, when she was writing this, it was... Um, the mid 2000s but really like a more obvious um uh example of that now as it's been manifested is of course like social media happened um really since um mackenzie walk was kind of coming up with these ideas so um that's a very obvious example of new like vectorless class um and it has big implications for music culture as we see like again i'm showing this slide of artist fan zero interference um yeah it's not important what you're sharing and communicating for apple sometimes but like so long as they're controlling all of their 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 um you're using their platforms for this communication um so another tool uh, another quite interesting um writer um uh, Abigail de Kosnick. Um, these are in the, um, there's like a reading list as well for people that signed up on the Zoom that sent out. So um, you can have a read of these later. Um, this is a really interesting essay, um, Fandom as Free Labor by Abigail de Kosnick. That was in a, uh, a really interesting reader as well that I recommend people hunt down the digital labor, the internet as playground reader that I think came out of a con conference that Trebo Schultz put together um, and um, yeah, it became a book. And in this in this book uh, in this text, sorry, Abigail Dukosnik, uh, who's is like a new media scholar, um, she's looking at changes in what it is to be a fan. Um, you know, originally the idea of a fan was one of like a a kind of um, obsessive outsider. Uh, the term comes from the Latin um, fanaticus, so like a fanatic. Um, to now like a, a really sort of um, prevalent sort of form of passive consumption now I mean uh, sorry active form of consumption um in in our sort of culture at large certainly in music culture so like fans don't just buy the music they'll produce fanzines and mixes and um mixtapes playlists on and now tiktok videos 
a very important part of um, music culture. Um, so yeah, uh, now we're starting to sort of see like to music, the production of music now is is sort of as much I think like the the sort of um, active consumption of fans and and listeners as it is the artist. Uh, I get to that a little bit more. Um, she's uh, looking at this as a, a, a form of free labor, um, which is a term, it's a specific term that she's getting from um, Tiziana Terranova, a really influential book as well. Like sort of, I mean, I guess MySpace was probably coming out in 2004, but it was uh, when um, Terranova was doing this research, it was sort of pre-Web 2.0 and very prescient. Um, she was looking at um, how the exa a good example that she gave was like AOL chat rooms of the 90s, um, at the, I mean, I guess now we, people are very skeptical of Facebook and, and these things now, but, um, at the time, something like the AOL chat rooms was seen as more generally like this great free tool that, um, you could just log on to and, and have a free means of communicating with people. Um, but in Terry, um, Terra Nova's research is sort of looking at how, well, actually these are, these are, um, the people sort of moderating these chat, chat forums and building these chat rooms are kind of building a sort of communication infrastructure for free for companies like AOL that are sort of extracting value from their free labor. Um, so it's a very influential sort of text in thinking about digital culture, um, which in turn, Terra Nova um, was, sort of drew this idea a little bit from um, uh, uh, Maurizio Lazzarato's idea of immaterial labor, which is even earlier still in, in the, the mid nineties. So definitely pre web 2.0, but very prescient of it. Um, uh, I'll just read this quote here that I've got on the screen because um, it's a really good one. Uh, immaterial labor refers directly to the changes taking place in workers' labor processes in big companies in the industrial and tertiary sectors where the skills involved in direct labor are increasingly skills involving cybernetics and computer control. On the other hand, immaterial labor involves a series of activities that are not ne normally ne recognized as work. In other words, the kinds of activities involved in defining and fixing cultural and artistic standards, fashions, tastes, consumer norms, and more strategically, public opinion. Um, so yeah, you're seeing that this immaterial labor is very crucial for um, communications and information technologies, but also um, uh, sort of to, to, uh, in, in line with what we're kind of discussing today, um, it really relates to the kind of things that we previously thought of as leisure um, and things that these sort of help sort of drive this product, um, this consumption cycle. And in the, in the context of like music subcultures, it's, you can think of like YouTube uploading a cover of, of someone, um, on YouTube, uh, SoundCloud reposts, uh, you know, even just sharing things on social media. This is all a form of kind of immaterial, uh, immaterial labor in a way. Um, Lazarado also has this really great quote that I think relates a bit to what I was kind of mentioning earlier about, um, this kind of drive towards um, uh, sort of uh, self-expression and individualism as being the sort of crux of like the post maybe 1968 kind of land, new spirit of capitalism. Um, that's a, like um, Boltansky and Chiapella, um, uh, what they call it. But um, the, the quote is, the new slogan of Western societies is that we should all become subjects. It's very much sort of focused on the I and the me and the individual expression as a sort of like dogma that, that Lazzarato is, is sort of talking about quite interestingly. Um, so yeah, so now we have today, um, and I'm not gonna play Old Town Road, but um, this is like, a, a again, like a real watershed moment, the Little Nas X Old Town Road a few years ago um, is, I mean, done to death, and everyone knows that it's done to death, but it's like um, a huge TikTok moment. But um, what's so interesting is that like, this song was really just, it's not really a song. It's sort of like a, a sort of form of collective labor really. And Lil Nas X, I think when he came out really recognized this, he was like, okay, I need to have a hit. I think he might've even, I don't, I, I'm not certain of this, but I think he might've actually started this TikTok challenge as a way to get it out. So it was like a marketing exercise, but um, the song wouldn't really exist without the sort of hordes of kind of fans and uh, immaterial laborers maybe on TikTok sort of producing the videos. Um, so yeah, it, yeah, this creative labor is really like a big collective thing at the moment. That's, um, yeah, the, there's this, again, it's this blurring of a barrier between artists and fans. Um, uh, and then we have more recent TikTok, like this year, um, Pink Panther S 
who uh, as I guess like essentially makes like y- uh, UK garage kind of tracks, but like a minute and a half long, which is uh, interesting for like something that I wanted to talk a little bit about now is has the effects of format on on um, on subcultures and aesthetics. Um, I guess UK garage was maybe more of a club oriented genre in the 2000s and so songs were long but if you're writing for TikTok you don't even need a full minute and a half so I mean her songs are so short um, and I guess they're pop songs as well the, the format of pop is you know typically like three and a half minutes long but even that in itself is sort of a product of media I think it was the like the first phonograph records could only fit like three five minutes of music on it and that's sort of the beginning of three minutes being this perfect pop song, but actually it's sort of a product of media in a way. Um, but yeah, I wanted to show this slide because um, what was kind of interesting to me is when I looked at the, this is like her debut album, which is sort of a mixtape because it's just tracks that have been released already. But if you look at it on Spotify, at least in um, at least in the UK, um, just underneath the, the album description, it says like Topsify UK, and I, I didn't know what that was, like if it was a, um, like the, it's not the record label that she's signed to, um, but if you click on it, it'll take you to a screen that you see on the right, which is the other things that Topsify UK produce. And guess they're just one of those um, sort of Spotify playlist companies that compile playlists. And this has sort of been um, c- classified as a playlist um, produced by them. I don't know how they're extracting value from it, but you see the other playlists that they've created. They look very much just sort of like a computer generated thing, um, almost like greatest hits ever, you know, hundred great Christmas songs and these sorts of things, like very generic kind of stuff. Um, uh, almost like a, yeah, a robot made it. Uh, and that's sort of the shifting kind of um, format of, of, of albums these days in a really interesting way, this sort of shift towards playlist culture. Um, one kind of fi- final thinker that I wanted to introduce um, into this, I don't have a slide, with her text, but um, the popular music scholar um, Robin James is really interesting to look at. Uh, and she's done some writing in a great text called Songs of Myself, um, which is also in the reading list um, for this if you wanted to check it out. But it, it's it's on um, real life, the, the, um, the platform online. Um, if you look up Robin James, Songs of Myself, real life, you'll probably read it. Um, but she's writing really interestingly on how technology is affecting genre in music. Uh, and that we're kind of moving away from ideas of genre itself, which is based around demographics. Um, so like groups of people producing a certain music or from a certain place, often quite racialized as well, genres, um, towards format, um, which is being done by a, um, uh, what she's sort of explaining, um, psychometric analysis. So rather than grouping things in terms of demographic, grouping things in terms of people's behaviors. So. I might click on this song and then the next song I click is um, uh, like a, a, a country song and then the song after that is a metal song and whatever. And um, this is like the logic of sort of YouTube algorithms. Things are kind of grouped, not necessarily according to genre, but in terms of like um, a behavioral analysis. Uh, so, uh, and that's, um, Robin James is quite critical of the sort of datafication of that. Uh, I'll just read a, a, a nice quote of hers. Um, Uh, The rise of psychometric analysis has changed the way we think and talk about genre and format in pop music. As companies like YouTube begin to use psychometric techniques, using people's online behaviors to define genre tags, um, this distinction Weisbar draws, I'm sorry, that's a reference from the text, between formats, industry-driven categorizations of people, and genre, scene-driven categorizations of aesthetics, start to break down. This breakdown is symptomatic of broad transformations in how we understand relations among sounds and people. Psychometrics convert inherently qualitative phenomena like moods and preferences into a specific type of mathematical relationship. So yeah, it's an interesting text and I recommend people um, hunt it down. Yeah, so these are some tools. Um, Sorry, it's a lot of information maybe. Um, But yeah, I hope you can watch this back as well if you like and, and like maybe unpack from it I wanted to now sort of just like have a bit of a practical discussion on um, some of the things since I was interested in this um, a few years ago doing a lot of research on this is I've been working with AQ and B um, is that uh, just check the sounds not playing yet yeah good um, yeah so AQ and B um, 
by way of introduction, I'll first sort of uh, play a little something from an artist that we've worked with who's quite interesting, a music producer. Um, Umru uh, is one of the PC Music Fold, but a, a more recent addition to PC Music um, and works, produces stuff also for like Charlie XCX and Tommy Cash. Um, but a really interesting artist because he's very um, sort of uh, self-aware of the way digital platforms sort of shape a musician's um, kind of trajectory and palette and he's also quite interested in ideas like search engine optimization and these sorts of things. Um, when I interviewed him a few years ago, he was talking about, he made this really interesting point that he thinks like six, nine songs being named Kuda are purposefully like unique search terms. Um, but yeah, he also had this to say on TikTok. I'm just going to play, see if it plays. It's still, it's still somehow like as, as like weird as that platform is, it's still literally like, I don't know, in, in some ways makes the whole like, you know, you could like, yeah, it makes everything a little more like an even playing field or a more random playing field. It's like, you can tell like th there's label released songs where you can tell they want it to be a TikTok right. song. They yeah. advertise it on the, on the top of TikTok on the music page, they have like a banner ad and it's like, use our song. You know, this is, has a lot of money behind it. And then like the right. song that blows up is like Pink Panther S like, who's just making like jungle pop music. And it's like, cool. Um, yeah. So, uh, about AQ and B, um, we are, uh, uh, an online editorial platform. It was started in um, uh, 2012 uh, and I've just joined in, in 2018. Um, and we sort of uh, basically like online magazine was the initial beginnings. Um, you, we write, you know, critical reviews and interviews with artists. Um, we share documentation. We do music premieres. Um, but I guess in recent years, really, and maybe in the topic of this talk, um, I maybe it's interesting to think through the ways that AQMB has sort of almost become like a constellation of um, the ways in which we use certain um, social media platforms in a way. Um, I, I sort of think and wonder about this, like how much of our audience um, knows of us as a website um, because, uh, you know, that for me is the core of what AQMB was, but I've been following it for years and years. Um, but in recent years, you know, I guess there's probably a core of people that sort of associate AQMB as a SoundCloud account. <laughs> uh, and there's this, this um, like 9,000 followers, maybe they're a distinct kind of audience in themselves. Um, and how much of, uh, as an editorial platform, you have to start to think to yourself, well, how much are we thinking that we should release things according to our certain individual audiences? Um, we have uh, a quite popular Instagram account, which is maybe the biggest audience that we have I guess um, and I sort of wonder all the time like how much does the logic of Instagram kind of feed what we do as an editorial platform do we share certain kind of uh, do we start to tune our kind of sharing in line with like what um, Instagram is as what is doing well on Instagram um, do we sort of start to feed the logic of the platform a little bit I say we try not to but um, it's definitely this sort of um, sort of paranoia on my mind is what happens when you start to cede too much to the platforms and their sort of editorial logic of their own. Um, and then I guess that, you know, the, certainly the, the big risk is, I mean, a, a few, um, just check how I'm going for time, a, a few, uh, uh, when was it, a few months ago now, maybe a couple months ago, um, our platform just kind of, uh, uh, our Instagram account just disappeared um, off um, of Instagram. It's happening to a lot of people getting zucked like this year. It's, I don't like, I don't know what's going on, but so many people's accounts are getting taken down. Um, that's just that, that's one thing that as a um, independent editorial platform, it's a bit of a nightmare, but beyond that, even further, I think the big nightmare is that now we kind of realize how reliant we are on Instagram, what happens when they tweak things. Um, we are for Instagram. We're an image-based page where we sort of our, we share a lot of documentation, and it's often that people go to our Instagram to see the documentation. They don't necessarily go to our website to see the still images. Um, and you know, it's always our still image documentation that does the best on Instagram, rather than sharing about actual um, articles that we're posting on the site. Funnily, um, but you know, what happens when Instagram tweaks that? As they are now, they're saying, "Oh, well, we're going to become a." 
a video sharing platform now um, that all of a sudden all this kind of labor that we've done to build our platform for Instagram has now um, is sort of like a bit of death switch for our account if we have to now sort of like tune to their their sort of shifting logic so um, yeah that's sort of these are kind of the ways that we've been affected a little bit and um, I guess you start to sort of uh, I'm only starting to try and now apply some of this thinking that I've been doing in past years um, to sort of the the day-to-day -day running of an online editorial platform I don't really have any answers at this point this is where they're like um, this this sort of workshop can kind of just become like a starting point for further thinking for myself or for anyone uh, anyone watching that's interested um, yeah so I'm, I'm kind of racing through but I did sort of just more or less want to finish um, uh, on on this kind of quote um, which uh, uh, Bogna Konya's um, The Dark Forest Theory of the Internet um, which I don't know I, I was gonna and maybe I'll have a, a little bit of a, a brief sort of discussion after this on um, kind of the future and like web 2.5 and web 3 so-called um, but yeah this is quite an interesting and provocative text um, as a I guess a critique of web 2 culture um, that comes from and I, I hope I'm not going to butcher this um, this explanation because uh, it's it's from a book that I haven't read but the the dark forest which is a sci-fi novel um, Liu Shishin um, writing about uh, I, I guess as I say I haven't read it but my understanding of it of is 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 that it's a science fiction set in a universe that's um, uh, we kind of why the universe is silent why we haven't sort of seen alien life is that um, once uh, it's sort of a conscious thing that to communicate you put yourself up at risk of being attacked and you make yourself um, put yourself in a vulnerable situation um, so the alien life is out there it's just staying quiet for safety's sake um, and um, this has sort of been applied to um, web 2 interestingly by Bogner um, Konya um, so I'll, I'll just kind of read this quote um, web 2 rests on two axioms first sociality is a prim primary human need communication is necessary for survival uh, second sociality is the carrier of all human conflict so more sociality more entropy um, our nervous systems cannot distinguish between sociality and survival um, and so we are sentenced uh, to each other the whole internet has been dealt a dead hand uh, in this text um, there's really interesting writing on how um, uh, on one hand we have this sort of desperate urge to communicate that I was talking a little bit about earlier and web 2 platforms really play off that this sort of need to sort of put information out there but it sort of always inevitably leads to conflict as we know with this kind of the how, how shit <laughs> web 2 makes us feel um, participating in this kind of um, this sort of endless barrage of communication uh, and so consequently um, this term um, maybe some people are familiar with it it's being applied a little bit more I think to um, like small uh, smaller communities that are developing now on the internet on things like discord um, people referring to like small like a small discord server as like a dark forest community um, as a way of like I guess reducing the communication to a smaller sort of more secret um, community as a way of sort of avoiding that sort of um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for like uh, expansive <laughs> Uh, logic of web 2 that's more like grow and grow and grow increase follower count more communication more um, uh, yeah more broadcasts and, and more like followers um, and that's an important thing as well because uh, one thing that I wanted to maybe end on thinking um, uh, I didn't really think that I had the really the time or expertise here to sort of go into um, some of the positive uh, the uh, maybe p people's sort of positive views on blockchain as a way of um, solving some of these issues um, uh, if anyone wants to hit me up with with sort of uh, their views on how um, some of this relates to what I've been talking about but I guess this, I mean the sort of positivist view is that maybe like decentralization getting rid of these big platforms via blockchain um, is a way of taking back sort of power from big tech but in the blockchain project that I, I mean aside from the this I I'm w one of the people that has this like critique that's done to death always of like just pulling my hair out over the financialization of everything through blockchain but that's beside a separate point one point I kind of wanted to raise is an 
um, maybe a thinking point is how much of Web 2's logic do we um, take with us into Web 3, like remediation? I'm not really describing um, Web 3 so much here, so I'm, um, I'm, I'm very sorry if, it's, if I'm leaving people in the dark a little bit, but um, by way of example, um, uh, one platform that has come to mind um, recently, I'm, being a writer, I'm always thinking about like how do I sort of, I've worked for free for so much <laughs> because of this um, kind of urge to sort of ex express myself as a writer and you know have these unpaid opportunities and whatever i'm at this point where i really would love to start to get paid for my work and then this platform comes along called mirror which some people might have heard of mirror.xyz um, and it's a blockchain kind of based uh, version of something like medium.com uh, it's a platform for writers to sort of um, monetize their work a little bit um, so I was like, oh, great, I want to sign up to this and sort of learn more about it. I still personally do not really get too much how blockchain sort of fits into the picture with it. But I think you can, you know, NFTs are involved in some way and you can do crowdfunding through um, payments of, of crypto that will accru accrue in value and so forth. I don't know. But I didn't really manage to get past the sign up point because I'm not a Twitter user. Uh, and when I tried to sign up, um, you have to have a Twitter account. And basically to get admitted into the platform, there's a, there's like a race each week where um, people vote up the users that they want to let into the community of writers. Uh, and everyone has to have, or at least a few months ago when I tried, everyone had to have a Twitter account. Uh, and then you could immediately see that um, the lists of the people sort of getting in were ones that had a big Twitter following already, big Twitter base um, to sort of help push them their votes up. Um, to be sort of admitted into the platform. And that's an interesting sort of uh, uh, re, uh, uh, this kind of idea in media theory of remediation of when an old form of media sort of takes some, some aspect of it into new forms of media, how we look at screens as we would look at uh, windows before screen technology. And um, I think for me, that's a, a form of this kind of, uh, I'm trying to find a better word than an ex expansive, uh, uh, it's lost on me now, but a cruel <laughs> logic of Web 2 um, being adapted onto to Web 3. So I think we need to look sort of for new ways that can kind of keep things a bit reductive. And um, yeah, uh, that's uh, sort of some rambling thoughts on, because uh, I, I did say, I did promise that I was going to talk a little bit about Web 3. And as it came to it, I when I was preparing this workshop, I just had so much to sort of think about with, with internet music subcultures. So I just kind of... Um, wanted to sort of put in a little open question at the end and yeah thank you so much Anna for for having me today yep to just like have some conversation I just thought that like you know like this experience of uh, you doing the research now into like hardware how it was influencing this stuff before and how hardware and like platforms influence our production now allows to have like a really interesting like how people are going to think about like our generation in like 30 years time kind of perspective have you had these thoughts when you were like looking into um, the cassettes and like like how did it feel like did did you have this like thoughts about like oh yeah people are gonna like have fun looking at the like pc music or like i i don't know like i i haven't thought so much in terms of like how our kind of culture of today would be looked at in the future but what i did think of in looking at this this past 30 years i think there was this like real significant break with ideas of authenticity that i think is like a a permanent break in a way that's kind of interesting that future generations maybe will look at us with less horror than perhaps um uh past generations uh, of artists and creatives look towards the future um, and that I think to do is something to do with this kind of change as I was talking a little bit about on the aesthetic sense of like lo-fi you know signifying the authentic um, uh, that sort of breakdown in authenticity as something that has uh, and probably don't have the sort of time or like um, preparation to sort of go into a discussion of the meaning of authenticity, but such a huge important word in in cultural studies. Um, but yeah, this sort of changing value of what authenticity is, I think, is probably the maybe in my mind looking at subcultures the biggest sort of shift 
that I think will have ramifications down the future will be less alien maybe or even like kids these days like <laughs> like Gen Z um, will be like maybe less alien to for future generations than than they are to a generation 30 years prior I think yeah yeah that's very interesting I was also thinking about like your own relationship to social media because as you mentioned you don't have Twitter as a writer so how do you position yourself as like social media a q and b and like your own writing practice because as far as i understand you have your own like writing pieces that come out outside of a q and b so like do you try to create your own like online identity that like stitches it all together or well i've in this one i've been sort of really lucky to be attached to a q and b the last few years because uh I'm terrible with social media and and I I mean I guess there were times when I was uncomfortable with it and and sort of tried you know I deleted my accounts and whatever and now and maybe it's in line with this sort of like changing thoughts on um discomfort towards surveillance but also authenticity and whatever and this feels like this breakdown moment um I'm back on it but I'm still not really good at it or still not really having too much interest in maintaining this labor but I can piggyback on the fact that I'm attached to AQMB and we have this sort of presence and also my colleagues sort of manage the social media there more. And I think for me, that's sort of, it's not an unnoticed, um, uh, something that's important to me. I know as a, as a, as like a culture worker, it's very important for me to have this presence on these platforms as sort of become ingrained. Um, and, uh, I can sort of piggyback off that in a way, um, and uh yeah that's that's just my personal experience um so i'm I'm quite thankful for my ability to work with aqmb because uh yeah i was i was a lot more uh i didn't get so many opportunities a few years ago before i, I had i sort of had to work my way in i think as a to i was someone that really wanted to develop my profile through the actual work that i did not through having a social media presence and uh it was hard so it, it helps to be able to attach oneself to an existing platform. But um, yeah, that's not really a, a, a political position yeah, on, yeah, yeah, yeah. on how, how uncomfortable platforms make me. I mean, I've come to, unfortunately, and maybe there'll be people watching that disagree, like sort of just succumb to the inevitability of the day-to-day -day need to use these platforms and but just trying to keep a critical open mind to them. Yeah, yeah. I think we can close it up now. Thank you. Thank you so very much. much. It was really interesting. I learned a lot from you today. I had a lot of fun. Thanks so much, Anna. Thank you.